I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that you're in the house of God today. Um, just everything that's happening right now in our world, in our society. How many of you know it's a good thing to come to the house of God? It is just one of those things. And he says, as you see the day approaching, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together because we need it more and more. We need people more and more. And so just thank you for being here today. Thank you for being a part. If you're a guest today, we are glad to have you here in the house of God. We believe that God's going to do something miraculous for you and believe with you that God's going to do that work of grace. So we're glad that you're here with us. Uh, last week, we were just, God did so many amazing things. We saw four people make decisions for Jesus Christ. Can somebody give God praise? We also saw seven people went public with their faith and said, I've decided to follow Jesus Christ. I have made that public confession of faith, and that's what God is doing. You've also helped this week with people that could not need it, financial assistance this week because they could not pay their mortgage, they could not do that because of some things totally out of their control. Our church stepped up and did a work. And your faithfulness in tithing and giving makes all the difference in the world. You're so faithful, and you're so good about doing what God has called you to do. So thank you so much for what you're doing from everywhere, from Israel to other places that we're in right now. And God is using our church to bless, to touch. How many of you know we have been given much? So much is required out of us. And so we're, we're happy to be a part of what God's doing there. So thank you so much. You can text to give. You can go online and give. There's some boxes in the back that you can give with. So thank you so much for what you're doing right now. I'm going to jump into the Word of God. In Isaiah chapter 40. And then I'm going to go to Jonah chapter 2. Last week we started a message series on the will of God or God's plan for your life. And this morning, I want, I want to talk about something out of Isaiah and then go to Jonah chapter 2. We started with Jonah chapter 1 last week. Jonah went in the wrong direction, ended up in places he shouldn't have been in a storm that he put himself in. And so, does God give second chances to people that go in the wrong direction? How many of you are a product of, I went in the wrong direction before, but God got my attention? And so... When we see that in our own lives, we can look at our own lives like this. There are going to be seasons in our life that we don't quite understand about the will of God. If you live through 2020, you realize there were some things that you were not going to understand about life. If you're just this year, there's been things that we did not understand about life. And how life goes. But I want you to look with me to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27. I'm going to read a lengthy passage. I want you to stay with me. It says, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from God? Has thou known, and has thou heard? That the everlasting God, the, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not. How many of you know he's always on the job? He is always God. He does not faint. He does not need vacation. He does not need a nap. He does not need what we need because he faints not. Neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. He giveth power to the faint. Some of you this morning, there may have been a faint moment that happened in your house getting children ready. Can I get an amen? Getting teenagers to get up one more time. Everything that you went through, he says, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But they, and this is what I want to get to, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up 
with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Let me read that last part again because I want you to get it in your spirit. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If you've been to the doctor lately, and all of our medical professionals, we love you. But if you've been to the doctor lately, your appointment's at 1 o'clock, and you hope you packed a lunch. Because once you got back there at 4 o'clock, you were angry. <laughs> you were upset. There's a waiting, they call it the waiting room. What they should call it is, I think my doctor is out getting nine holes of golf fence. And I don't know if I can wait any longer. The magazines are old. You're worried about the person coughing on the other side of the room. And you're wondering about what's going to happen next. And it's a waiting room. There's been other times in my life that I've been in that waiting room and I've been in that waiting room asking these questions. Would God give me a second chance? Does God know where I am? Does God understand that it's bad and I'm sick and I don't know what to do and my heart is hurt and I don't understand what's happening right now in my life and you promised me these things, you promised me the victory, these things in my life, and you said, God, if I would commit my ways to you, you would give me the desires of my heart, but you're right in the waiting season of your life and saying, God, I prayed, I fasted, I've done all that I know to do, and God, I don't know what I'm going to do next, and I don't know if this will ever be over with, and I just feel like I'm in a time in my life that all my life is about waiting. All my life is about just making it another day. And it's bad when you wake up going, wonder what we're going to have for lunch. Because that's the highlight of your day. You go make a BLT, and you've only got, you know, the, 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 the L. And you go, God... Where's the tomato? Where's the bacon? God, where's the moment in my life? God, you said that you had a plan for my life. You talked about a plan to prosper me, not to harm me, a plan for a hope and a future. And God, I look at my life right now, and I'm saying, I just feel like I'm in the waiting room, and no prayers are getting answered, and no miracles are happening. And I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I can't even figure out what's wrong with myself. I don't want to be in the depression I'm in right now. I don't want to be in the physical part of my life that I'm in right now. And God, I don't know what to do next, and it just seems like I'm in the waiting room. And you think if I can get to the doctor, he'll, 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 he'll give me something, or I, or I can... As believers, we can reach out and touch the hem of his garment and be made whole. But God, it just feels like to me right now that I'm just waiting. I don't like my job. I don't like my relationships. I don't, and I prayed and I've been faithful and I don't know what to do next. But God, I need you to help me because I'm going to faint. I'm going to grow weary and well doing if you don't answer me. And I'm in the waiting season. I'm saying, God, I studied. I, I did all that I knew to do. I apologized. I, I did everything. And then there's other times that I'm in a waiting season because I went in the wrong direction. I got in the relationship, but God said, no, 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 no. And you went head into the relationship. And you said, I can change them. I'm on a missionary date right now. And you started a business that God told you not to start. And you said it even when the Holy Spirit was convicting you not to say it. And then you wondered why everybody was mad at you after the fact. 
And you're in a waiting season because you went in the wrong direction. And you're having to wait. Jonah had to wait. He was going directly opposite of Nineveh. God told him to go and to preach the word. And he decided not to do it. But God had a way of even in his disobedience to say, I'm going to use the storm to put you in the waiting room that will become a classroom that will change your life forever. (laughs) There's a moment that you're in right now that you're saying, God, I don't understand the season that I'm in right now, and I don't understand the moment that I'm in right now, but God is going to take this waiting room that you're in right now, this moment that you're in right now, that it doesn't seem like anything is happening and nothing is going forward, and say, God, I know that you're going to do work in my life. I want you to go with me to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord from the belly of the fish. Now, how many of you grew up in Sunday school? You ever seen a flannel graph before a day in your life? Okay, you got to be over the age of something to get there. I won't call any names. But when I saw Joni in the belly, belly, belly of the whale, I want to say belly of the pig. I don't know why. I think it's the BLT you got me. On the flannel graph, Chair, table, the little, you know, candle, and he was writing something and eating sushi. The eating sushi thing I threw in there. (laughs) He was right in the middle. He was right in the middle of the moment having to wait. Day one. Now, they always have him like upright sitting in a chair the whole nine yards. No, no, no. No, no, no. Does everybody get that? No. Take that picture out of your mind right now. How many fishermen do I have here this morning? Cleaned any fish lately? That's as far as I'll go with that. It wasn't pretty. There was no potpourri. It was not where you want it to be. So day one happens, and he's in the waiting room. Day two happens, and he's in the waiting room. Day three happens, and he's in the waiting room. He's in this waiting room that nobody wants to be in, and he's there. And you have a decision in your waiting room of what you're going to do. Now, notice this what he did. Did Jonah pray to the Lord from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. He answered me out of the belly of Sheol. Now that's the depths or the graves. And I cried, and you heard my voice. He is crying out. He is crying out. In the waiting season that you're in right now, in the waiting room that you're in right now, you can pray for deliverance. In the depths of where you are, you say, Pastor, my sin is too great for me to pray. Let me tell you something. He's waiting to hear from you right now. You may be in a time of trouble in your business, in your family, in your life right now. He said, I'm a very present help in your time of need. You don't have to get good enough for God to hear your prayer. The honest prayer of people, of humanity, God will hear and God will answer. And you understand this is, you see these praying for that deliverance that's there, seeing God's goodness. He wants to see God. He said, but I'm in distress right now. Now, if I'm in distress, I want to pray a prayer that is good and effective. And I think about the book of James where it says that, you know, Elijah was a man subject to like passions like we are, but he prayed. And he prayed, and it didn't rain, and then he prayed again, and it rained. I want to be around somebody that when they pray, it doesn't rain, and when they pray again, it rains again. See, the only way that this can happen is to know the will of God. And the only way that you're going to know the will of God is to know the Word of God. So Jonah was praying 
Psalms 18, Psalms 31, Psalms 42, that he was praying these things that he had heard from the psalmist and David and other writers because he had hid the word of God in his heart that when he was in the valley, when he was in the depths, when he was in the, the, the belly of the fish and where he didn't want to be, there was something that came up to him. And I want you to understand this. You better hide the word of God in your heart because there's going to be a day that you won't have your out there. There's going to be a day that you may not even have your Bible there. There's a day that's going to come that you're going to need to know the Word of God and hide it in your heart and memorize it and know it and speak it and let it be in your heart that it changes everything. So when you have that Word, he said, I may be in the belly of the fish right now, but the Word of God is still hidden in my heart. I still have light because Jesus is my light. I still have hope. Because I know Jehovah Jireh, he is my provider. I still have peace because Jehovah Shalom is my peace. Not my circumstance is my peace. I have Jehovah Shalom. He is my peace. Psalms 139, verse 23. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Know my heart. Now, this is about to open up some things for y'all. Know my heart. I can't know your heart. Now, I can see your fruit. Now, Jesus taught, judge not that you be not judged, but he said you will know them by their fruit. 2020 and 2021 has revealed a lot of people, right? It didn't change them. It just revealed them. It reveals love. It reveals loyalty. It reveals faithfulness. When you're in crisis. So when you're in these seasons in your life and you don't know what to do, you better have that word of God hid in your heart. That you've got a place to stand when all the winds and waves are coming at you. Now notice this. Try me. And know my anxieties. No. How many of you know you got issues? Some of y'all are like, I don't. You got issues. I've got issues. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and keep on preaching this until you say amen. You've got issues. You've got issues. You, you got things. You can go. They can get your order wrong at Hardy's. And you're out there rebuking the devil. And like, they just got your order wrong. Spilt your latte, and you are all messed up for the rest of the day. Devil's after me. What I did when I was 15 is coming back right now. I know that God forgave me, but if he would have forgiven me, my latte would be right right now. We got issues. We got things that we have to deal with. God, know, know what I have to deal with, God. God, know me. God, know me. Know that that relationship failed, but that doesn't mean that every other relationship has to fall. Yeah, that business didn't make it, but I'm believing that God, he put me here, so I'm going to make it in Jesus' name. No, 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 no. It didn't happen like I thought it was going to happen at the last place. But I believe that God is a God of a second chance. And God will do exceedingly abundantly above what we even asked or think. We can get crazy in a hurry. That must mean that I don't know. We don't have to be like that. God help me. But God, you know my defaults, you know my failures, you know what I went through. God, you know everything about me, God. You know who I am. You know how I was raised. God, you know the things that I have went through. God, you know everything. But notice this. He says these words. He said, and see, God, do inventory. God, do inventory in my life. See, it's not to condemn you, it's to convict you so that you can change, that you can repent 
and change your actions and your attitude to be more like Jesus Christ so that when you're closer to Jesus Christ, you'll be closer to the will of God than you've ever been in your life. He's not doing it to say, be perfect, be perfect, be perfect. No, no, no. I'm just going to get close to him so I love him so much that I don't want to sin and come short of his glory. And notice this. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. <laughs> so where I start, no matter what my anxieties are, where I start, you know, I'm going to get there. You know why I'm going to get there? Because he's the author and the finisher of my faith. You know why I'm going to get there? He's already made a way in the wilderness and a stream in the desert. You know why I'm going to get there? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know why I'm going to get there? Even though I'm in the valley of the shadow, I don't have to fear evil because he is with me. And when you realize this, everything starts to change. I'm in the waiting room, but I'm going to pray. Second thing is I'm in the waiting room. But I'm going to deal with my reality. Let me tell you something about reality sometimes. It's bad. You know it. I know it. And God knows it. It's bad. You know it. You know. Well, you know, my, my, my kids, they walk on water. My teenagers, I don't even have to tell them about their homework. They clean their room even before anybody else gets up in the morning. My marriage, we've never fought one time. You're not living together if you haven't fought one time. You went to the wedding, but you didn't make it to the marriage. Deal with the realities. He was in the belly of the fish. It wasn't where he wanted to be. Now, he was thankful that the storm passed, but he was in the waiting room. I want you to look at this verse 3. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. I want to say this for somebody. You may feel so far away from God right now, but God's not that far away from you. You feel like giving up. God says, just turn your face toward me because I'm a very present help and now I'm in need. Yet shall I look again into your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my heads at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed in me forever. I was in a prison. Sheol was all around me. I was trapped. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I put myself in this wrong direction because I wouldn't do what God said. I was disobedient. I found myself where I am, but that's not the end of the story. You may be where you are right now, but that's not the end of the story. He came to set the captives free. The work of grace to be done. You say it's over and it's done with. Nobody understands, but he came to set the captive free. He said, yeah. You brought my life from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came before you into your holy temple. Clarity, having this clarity moment of I know where I am, but I'm not going to stay there. I will continually change my attitude and my actions to make this waiting room that I'm in right now make it worth the struggle. I may be in it right now, but this waiting room that I'm in right now is going to be worth. Going to be worth. It's going to be worth it because, yes, you're there right now, 
but you're not going to stay there forever. You're in a season right now that it doesn't seem like anything can go right in your life, but you keep on trusting in His unchanging hand, and God will make a way where there is no way. There may be something that changes in your life, but God's got you right in the palm of His hand. He'll never change you. In Psalms 30, verse 5, it says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. 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 Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You need to understand in your heart, in your mind right now, you may not understand where you are. Go ahead and weep right now in the reality that you're in right now. But when the sun comes up, wipe your eyes and start walking again. Start doing what God has called you to do. You think it's hopeless where you are right now. I serve the God that can give hope to the hopeless. Third thing I want to give you. First, in the waiting room, we pray. The second thing we do in the waiting room is deal with our realities. The third thing we do in the waiting room is we start anticipating what God's going to do. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 8 says, Those who, who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Let me read that again. Because if you do not get anything else in this message, I want you to grab a hold of this. Those who pay in regard to vain idols forsake, forsake. Not that their hope is forsaken them, they forsake their hope. Of steadfast love. You may feel like you're the most in neutral, don't know where you are, don't have any hope in your life right now. You may feel like that for different areas of your life. Your business is going great, but your family is is struggling right now and you're in the waiting room. There's others of you that thinks, well, I believe God God did this in my life and I don't know what to do. And I know that God put this business in my life, this relationship in my life, this desire in my life, but I feel like I'm in the waiting room right now. And if we're not careful, if our focus does not change, we will start focusing on those things. How many of you know that God's been good to us? Let me say it again. How many of you know that God's been good to us? How many of you know you would not be sitting here without the goodness of God? The very breath in your lungs. That's why we pour out our praise. Because God gave us our breath in our lungs. So I'm going to pour out my praise to Him. But when we're in the waiting room, it can get easy. Because we get bored. How many of you have read magazines that you never would have read before in the waiting room? You came home and told your wife, hey, I think we could do this casserole. (laughs) Because you didn't have anything else to read in the waiting room. That's exactly what happens to too many people. They know that God's going to do something in their life, but they start turning their attention, and it ends up in vain idols. It starts worshiping the success that you had back then. It starts worshiping a style that you thought God moved in. It starts worshiping things that you cannot even imagine in your life. And you start having to look at yourself and say, okay, am I worshiping the true and the living God? Or am I worshiping stuff? Am I I worshiping comfort? Am I worshiping whatever it may be in your life? Or am I saying, I don't worship vain idols. I don't worship those things. I worship a true and a living God. And when I worship, now every time I come to church, I feel like raising my hands every time. No, I don't. No, you don't. But how many of you have had a sacrifice of praise sometime in your life? How many of the time that your sacrifice of praise led you away from your vain idols into the presence of God and everything changed? 
How many times did that lead you to the place in your life that you said, okay, I'm tired of going down that path. I'm tired of staying in the waiting room in my misery. I want to do something else, and so I'm going to worship God. And my situation may not change right now, but I promise you my attitudes and my actions are going to change right now. I'm moving from just being to some action. I need some action in my life, so whether I feel like it or not, I'm going to shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Whether I feel like it or not, you're not playing along. I'm not doing that because 1960s, we never did do that. 1980s, we didn't do that. I'm not doing that. God wants to do a new thing. God God wants to do something that nobody's expecting right now because he's not going to be boxed into a style or a moment or anything else. He is God. He is sovereign, and he's going to do a new thing. Wait for it to spring up. Don't get left behind. God, I want. See, we haven't seen all that God wants to do. We haven't experienced. We don't have it. God is not in our little box saying, hey, if you fit into this little box, we'll worship you. No, he's the God that made heaven and earth, and we don't even know the galaxies that we're in right now. And he is my God. He is my Savior, and he is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. 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 Little children's book called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Anybody had one of those? He's going to move to Australia. Mother finally told him at the end of the book they even have problems in Australia too. There comes a point in your life that you have to say, in my waiting room, I will worship. I want you to see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. I'm going to only read the last part of this. It says, for it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more, it may increase in the thanksgiving. It may increase in the thanksgiving. See, if I'm operating in grace right now, I'm going to be more thankful. How many of you? can testify to the grace of God. How many of you can testify to the grace of God? How many of you know about the grace of God? How many of you know about the mercies of God? How many of you know we're going in the wrong direction and you put yourself in the bad relationship and you put yourself in the bad moment, but Jesus Christ did a work in your life? Grace, 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 mercy, love. I can't thank him enough. I should not be standing here today, but the grace of God is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. You should go with me. To Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. And the Lord spoke to the fish. And the Lord spoke to the fish. You know what God's teaching me right now? It's better for him to speak than me to speak. It's better for him to take care of me than me try to take care of them. It's better for him to fight my battle than for me to fight my battle. It's better. You got to make a decision. Are you going to let God speak? Or are you going to post? Are you going to let God speak? And you're going to run them down, do all that kind of stuff? Or are you going to let God speak? God will speak to your mountains. God will speak to your enemies. God will handle what you can't handle because the victory is his. Now, notice this, and it bombed it, Jonah, out into dry land. Now, vomiting is a reflex 
that allows the body to get rid of toxins and poisons. The fish needed Jonah gone, and Jonah needed the fish gone. And God says, I need you to vomit him up. Some of you went through some, some purging this year. They said they'd love you forever. And now you're looking around and going, I don't know where forever is, but it's not here. Oh, got you back. And then it went oh, right there. If you didn't know what that's what they meant, you would have stayed, you know, like in defensive position all the time. Love is gone. Loyalty's gone. Faithfulness is gone. And you're thinking to yourself, how did that happen? But see, there needed to be some purging to get you closer to the promise. There needed to be the vomit to get you to your victory. Now, I don't know about you. I never want to be that kind of sick. Can I get an amen? But it's only when I'm that sick and tired those toxins, that poison, can come out of my body. Now, many of you were taught when the purge happens, he still had to walk into the promise. Nineveh was 375 miles away from the sea. So God gave him enough time to clean himself up, start walking, and saying, Somebody would ask, do you want seafood? He goes, absolutely not. But he started walking. He started walking. He started walking into the promise. And he looked behind him and said, I don't have anything to go back to because that was the purge. There is the promise. And I'm going to go to where God has me. Not back to the belly. Not back to running from God. Not back to just the waiting room and, and all those kind of things. I'm going to get closer to the will of God than I've ever been in all of my life and say, God, you get first, you get best, you get everything. And God, I know what I went through. So I know what I went through. I know the struggle that I had. I know the moments that I had. I know everything about my life. And I know what it's been. But I believe that during the purge, the promise is closer than it's ever been in my life. And so when I look at my own life, I say it's hard, and I don't understand it all. But I will tell you this one thing, that if God's got us there, God's going to carry us the rest of the way. And what God started, he will also complete into the day of Jesus Christ. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes right there where you are. You said, Pastor, I'm going through a time in my life right now that I feel like I'm in the waiting room feel like all I'm doing is waiting right now. All I feel like I'm doing right now is just going to work every day. All I feel like I'm doing right now is just raising my hands. All I feel like I'm doing right now is just studying. And I don't see any promises right now. But I promise you the waiting room can be your classroom. And your classroom can be your launching pad into everything that God has for you. And so right there where you are, you say, Pastor, I'm in my waiting season right now. And I want to wait faithfully. If that's you right now, I want you to lift both hands to heaven right now. And say, God, I'm in my waiting season right now. But I'm going to pray. I'm going to worship. And I'm going to anticipate what you're doing right now. Heavenly Father. God, I pray in the name that's above every name right now. God, that you see this hands in the sanctuary online right now. God, that you're doing a work of grace for these people that are in their waiting season. God, I pray that we pray, we worship, we deal with our realities. 
We know what we're doing and we know how we're doing it. But God, in the purge, we will see a greater promise than we've ever seen before. God, we're not being going to be weary in well-doing. For in due season, if we faint not, you promised us a harvest. You promised us a work of grace. And God, I pray that you will do that in Jesus' name. If you'll stay with your head bowed and your eyes closed just for another moment. I'm going to do something this morning. I want to talk to somebody this morning. It's not by accident that you were here. It's not by accident that you were here. God, from the foundations of the world, put this message for you. It's not by accident. It's not just circumstance. It's not any of those things. You have a divine appointment with God. Online, you have a divine appointment with God. And you say, Pastor, I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I need to surrender my life fully, not to denomination, not to a church, not to man. I need to submit my life fully to Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want to do that fully to Jesus Christ. And I'm going to pray a prayer with you. You'll repeat it after me. Lord Jesus, please forgive me. Let your blood wash away all of my sins. I will serve you as my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name. Still with your head bowed and your eyes closed just for another moment. Online, if you did that this morning, if you'll text UGC Life to 474747, we'll give you your next steps. It's baptism, a Bible, a devotion book. And when you feel comfortable, you can walk through these doors. And we want you to be part of our family. Join a small group and all those kind of things. In this sanctuary, you said, Pastor, I have decided to follow Jesus Christ. If that's you this morning, if you'll just slip up your hand right there where you are. I have decided to follow Jesus Christ in my life. I've decided. Praise God. Praise God. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. I want everybody to stand together. We're going to sing this one more time. We're going to sing it with a thankful heart this morning. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at UGC Life Online. We are so encouraged to know that our services are reaching people all around the world. If God did something special for you, let us know by texting the word UGC Life to 474747. We would love to hear from you. If you would like to give to this ministry, go to UGCLife.com and hit the give button. We appreciate your generosity as we continue to reach our community with healing, hope, and help. Once again, it was great to worship with you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.